Because if it's physical, well, chimpanzees share 98% of the same DNA as us. Assertion. And celery has 50% of the same DNA as us. I want want Redeem Zoomer to accept a debate. Here's the proposition. Are humans and chimpanzees related through common ancestry? He can do the same thing with us. Debate seminar, four and a half hours. We can dig deep. I want to see the science. (laughs) Because, Ben, you know, we could spend the next three hours showing why what he just said is not true. We can get into the Y chromosome dissimilarity, the fact that overall gene content, size differences in architecture, the Y chromosomes are less than 30% the same. Redeem Zoomer, how do you address that? How do you explain all those massive differences? The the chimpanzee apparently lost the entirety of its heterochromatic arm. I just debated that a week ago with culture cats. Who knows the science? Even those that know the science don't have answers to these uh, challenges. 98%, well, that pay, uh, Dr. Rob Carter, just published an article in CMI covering the recent paper where if you dig into the supplementary material, I've got a couple slides on it for sake of time. I don't think it's necessary, but Redeem Zoomer is going to have to address the fact that uh, 12% of the human and chimpanzee genomes don't even align. And then they got to make excuses and say, well, that's because since the split, there's been structural rearrangements, there's been insertions, there's been deletions, there's been duplication. (laughs) <laughs> it's like they're assuming that these mutations even happen. But anyways, Ben, are you seeing a lot of assertions here and a lot of the assertions not even being backed by science? For example, like this claim here, 98% with chimps. Yeah, for sure. And in um, another video he did a while ago on the same topic, uh, he says and it's almost a quote, that I examined the scientific evidence for Darwinian evolution and found it to be conclusive. Yeah, right. He says he he examined it and found it to be conclusive, but then he never makes any scientific arguments. He never presents any of the evidence that he supposedly studied, okay? Um, I'm frankly skeptical that he has studied this at any level deeper than, you know, a Google search or something like that. Right. Um, but yeah, so there was this whole thing for many years about Jeffrey Tompkins' work on this uh, 98, 99% similarity number. Um, it turns out he did make a few mistakes. Um, and Robert Carter, sort of admitted that and taught has talked about it publicly but now there's some better data coming out including a chimpanzee genome that is not based on the human genome like the previous ones were um so of course if you base it on the human genome it's going to come out looking like the human genome um but they did a, a raw uh really good sequencing of the chimp genome and even an evolutionary biologist named Richard Bugs has come out and saying, yeah, this number is much lower than 98%. Um, and he's been on, he's been saying that for a long time. Um, I think Carter's article refers to Bugs. Um, but a big problem was for a very long time, evolutionists were simply excluding certain sequences from the analysis entirely. Why? Because their BLAST program or whatever program they were using to compare the sequences couldn't align them at all. And so they say, well, that's not in the analysis because, you know, it's, it's meaning. And part of the assumption was, is that it's meaningless, repetitive DNA. It doesn't have any meaning or it doesn't do anything. Right. And so they say, well, we're just excluding that from the analysis. And but the reason why it couldn't align at all is because it was so different that they couldn't align it. (laughs) And so they were only comparing the sequences that actually they could align using their programs. So they were comparing the sequences that were most like uh, most similar between chimps and humans and not the ones that were most dissimilar. (laughs) It's like and, and Tompkins made the point a long time ago that the chimp genome is just is 10% larger than the human genome. So doesn't that mean it's at least 10% different? <laughs> like, you know, just common sense. 
why are they sticking to this 98% number? Uh, it's because they want, want to persuade the public of evolution. And they see correctly that in a public creation, PR setting, a public relations setting where people, most people, like probably Redeem Zoomer himself, simply doesn't understand the science behind it, that this 98% number looks really impressive and evidence or even proof uh, that we're, we have a common ancestor. That's why they like this number and they defend right. it so uh, stringently. It's not because they care about science. It's because they care about a narrative that they're pushing out to the public. Yeah, I'd like to see Redeem Zoomer explain even within those similar regions, you find differences in the way those genes are regulated or the way they're expressed. So how did those changes come about since the split or changes, uh, differences we see in epigenetics or 3D arrangement of the genomes of human and chimpanzees? I mean, he just asserts 98%, but he doesn't get into any significant detail. So here's my challenge to redeem Zoomer. If humans and chimpanzees are related and go back to a common ancestor, and excellent points uh, you made there, Ben, well, the Y chromosome, that's uniparentally inherited DNA. It's passed on on one side. The father's side is paternally inherited. It lacks, for the most part, recombination. So it's less messy. But yet we know that the observed mutation rate in the Y chromosome is fast. It's about one to three per generation. Every single male Y chromosome on the planet is nearly identical, low genetic variation. But wait a minute, the mutation rate is fast. Mutations add something because they're, add something, they're adding something that was not previously there. So mutations do add diversity. I'm not saying it's necessary, uh, necessarily good diversity, but they do add diversity. So, okay, if we've been accumulating mutations in the Y chromosome for one to 200,000 years, redeem Zoomer, then why don't we find more genetic variation in male human Y chromosomes? And then when we bring in the chimpanzee, <laughs> have a look at this visual. The chimpanzee Y chromosome is half the size. So like you were saying, Ben, in terms of whole genome comparison, okay, if the Y chromosome is half the size, well, you're starting at 50%. You're starting at 50%. Notice the color coding here. So you've got uh, the gray, the black. I'll make this easier for people like Redeem Zoomer to see so they can refute it or attempt to refute it. The gray here, that's heterochromatin. That's a densely packed type of DNA comprises uh, repetitive sequences like satellite D uh, DNA. And you'll notice in the chimpanzee Y is totally gone, completely missing. So at some point since the split, the chimpanzee lineage it lost the entirety of its heterochromatic arm. And so when you compare overall gene content, size differences and architecture, the Y chromosomes are less than 30% the same. Bring in the gorilla Y. We're supposed to share a more distant common ancestor with the gorilla. The gorilla Y and the human Y, they're more similar to each other than either are to the chimp Y. Well, there's a break in their so-called nested hierarchy. And again, the, the, the Y chromosome should be more clean because it lacks recombination. The, uh, this scrambling every uh, generation of genetic variants, the chromosomes line up, exchange genetic material, so on and so forth. For the most part, the Y chromosome lacks that. So right here is, is a very uh, tough challenge for the evolutionary community. How, like he said, he's asserting that humans and chimps are related. How can they be in light of this data? And then what you had mentioned, uh, Ben, on the uh, this new paper here in 2025, over 12% of the human and chimpanzee genomes represent a gap difference. There are many genomic regions that cannot even be aligned. 2024, it's even worse <laughs> for the evolutionists. Here's human. Here's chimp. Scroll up, compare. Less than 30% when you compare everything. Those are some massive differences. And so the whole 98% assertion is just that. It's just an assertion, but I would like to see some evidence for that assertion. Sam, anything you want to add, brother? Yeah. Um, 
it's going to be different than that. So he's making a big whopping argument from science when he says that the Bible is made from dust and we have ancestors. Therefore, why couldn't Adam have ancestors? That's an argument from science. Questions aren't arguments. Um, so he's attempting to make an argument from science, but the Bible is not silent. So that's going to be a problem. The, uh, the Bible does not say that we were formed from the earth. But if you notice, if you go through the, the creation order, you, you'll see that God brings Sam, the... Sam, hold that thought. I just have to address these, these comments in real time. So Des Capital, unless I missed it, I have yet to see you send in an answer to the C-14 challenge. So we'll wait. Secondly, he says... He asserts that I did not address the long-term evolution experiment, experiment, Lenski's experiment in the culture cats debate. So I corrected him on that. I said, that's false. I literally spent two, I still have my notes. I spent two minutes showing why Lenski's experiment doesn't work. Actually, Lenski's experiment supports genetic degeneration and genetic entropy because what Lenski demonstrated was reductive evolution. Lenski's E. coli bacteria have shrunk in functional genome size. They're lazy, they're handicapped. So then he accepts correction in a way, but does a slap and run. He says, maybe you are. No, it's not. Maybe I'm correct. I did the debate. I remember I addressed it for two minutes straight. He says, maybe he literally missed that two minutes of the string. Yeah, you probably did. It was the rebuttal. <laughs> and then he says, Katz brought it up again later and he didn't hear a rebuttal. Yeah, he brought it up in his closing. How am I supposed to? Re it goes me, then him, then Q&A. So th the point is, these are the types of things we get from critics. He's not engaging anything. He's making uh, wild assertions. And I just had to call that out, Sam. But anyways, we're still waiting for an answer to the C-14 challenge. Sam, continue your thoughts, brother. I'm not going to hold my breath. And I do I do wonder, Donnie, that Linsky's experiment, are they still E. coli or are, are they something that's... <laughs> what, what's going on there? <laughs> They're multi-celled organisms now. <laughs> it's special. I had someone tell me, well, it's not an evolutionary experiment. They're not trying to get them to evolve. Well, what are they doing? <laughs> well, they're getting them to devolve de because right. they've degenerated significantly. Uh, but yeah, it, it, anyway, uh, so we got we have God calling the the fish out of the sea. We've got him creating the... the um, bringing forth the grass from the earth and but when it comes to man mankind we see something that's different that's an intimate relationship god didn't call mankind from these animals so there's another hermeneutical problem for them god created man a special creation it was an intimate relationship and god breathed life into his lungs and took the time to walk and talk with man in the garden but the point here though is that the Bible isn't silent, and that's why the argument from silence, which is fallacious, doesn't work anyway. Um, it's an intimate creation with man. So, yeah, anyone want to comment on that? Ben? Um, just that I, I don't think this, several of the arguments he makes here, including this one, are not really, I don't see how they're directly relevant to the age of the earth issue. Um, and the other thing that I would say is that I, I really hate it when critics say somebody said this and then don't <laughs> cite who they're talking about because that is, that is, that is evidence to me, maybe weak evidence that nobody actually said that. And this is a straw man. Okay, so if someone actually said that, I would like to know who it was so I can go and look it up <laughs> and see what they actually said, because half the time or more than that, they didn't say what they're being represented as saying by a critic. Um, so but if it's if it's somebody like some random person on Facebook, well, you can find anybody saying anything on some random person on Facebook. When you engage in scholarly intellectual debate, or at least intellectually honest debate, you should be addressing the strongest arguments from the most uh, the the most capable defenders of the position you're arguing yep. against. You should not be taking 
vague statements from the internet or from someone you met at church randomly or uh, something you literally probably just made up in your head as a possible argument might, the other side might make. You know, you need to examine our actual arguments, our actual positions and respond to those. Yeah, you know, when we're when we're debating or when I'm specifically debating online with atheists, for, for example, or non-Christians, it would be nice if they were honest. Um, I would, I would, it would be nice. We kind of expect that a little bit, but I'm not surprised when we catch them just bold-faced lying. And I'm not accusing Redeem, Redeem Zoomer of doing that at all. The, the point that I'm making, though, is that when, when you're a Christian, you identify as a Christian, that we are obligated by God to be honest and intellectually honest. And if our, if our position has been corrected, then we have to acknowledge those corrections and not repeat, you know, talking points that have been um, ambiguous, maybe we'll say. So we would expect more from somebody as who, who is a Christian and from ourselves. Very good, gentlemen. Excellent points all around.